Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, served them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Before we get to our guest today, I wanted to point out that we are now an award-winning program. We won the Portland Community Media Producer Peer Award uh, for Community and Free Speech. And so I wanted to point that out uh, and um, thank my crew and all everyone else who's associated with the program uh, because we, we do this as a team. So our guest today is Laura Stevens. Laura is the organizing representative for the Beyond Coal campaign with the Sierra Club. Welcome yeah. to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Today. Yeah, you, you betcha. Yeah. So Americans associate coal mining primarily with Pennsylvania and the Appalachian Mountains. That's where we usually think of it, but mm -hmm. that's not really where coal uh, comes from anymore. Well, that's right. A, a large chunk of, uh, of coal that's um, used to produce energy in the United States comes from the Powder River Basin, which is in Montana and Wyoming. Um, so this is also extremely destructive form of mining, like the coal mining that we're familiar with in Appalachia. Um, it's open pit coal mining where um, uh, heavy machinery is used to tear up the earth um, in Montana and Wyoming and, you know, pollute thousands of miles of streams and destroy lands and so on. Um, so. Uh, this is the Powder River Basin in Montana okay. and Wyoming where okay. all this coal all right. mining is done. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, in Appalachia, of course, they're, they're blowing the mountain top, right. tops off right. because the, the coal is deep in the ground. But right. in Powder River, it's very much close to the surface. Right, right. A uh, good friend of mine, Carol Ross, who just moved here from West Virginia, calls the mining in Powder River Basin, she calls it upside down mountaintop removal mining. Oh. <laughs> um, it's the same uh -huh. thing, um, you know, same wine in a new bottle. It's uh -huh. um, uh, tearing up the mountain, the tearing up the earth to get at coal seams. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do, do you have any statistics on um, on how much coal still comes from Pennsylvania, from the Appalachian Mountains versus from Powder River? I believe right now 40% of the coal burned in the United States comes from the Powder River Basin. I'm not sure how much comes from Appalachia, because okay. you know, I know there, yeah. there are other places where coal comes from as well, yes, but true. the Powder River Basin is one of the largest sources of coal in the world. 
um, at, at one of the largest deposits of coal in the world. My, my understanding is that the only larger deposit of coal in the world is in Alaska, but we can't actually access that coal very easily because it's under a thick layer of permafrost. But we'll of change course, that. Uh, yeah, of course, ironically, <laughs> with climate change, that's melting and making it more accessible. But uh -huh. So the Powder River Basin is the uh, largest reserves of coal in the world. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. So in, in uh, having all this coal in Powder River, how does it get to the places where it's, where it's needed? Yeah, so it's shipped by rail all over the country. Um, in Oregon it, and Washington, it's shipped to our last two coal-fired power plants, um, PGE's Boardman in eastern Oregon and Transalta's plant in Central Centralia, Washington. So these, this coal is shipped in open, open air, containers, mile and a half long coal trains. Uh, you know, often in the Powder River Basin, you see coal trains back to back, just um, ready to travel hundreds of miles. Uh -huh. Of course, hundreds of miles powered by fossil fuels uh, yeah. to get to coal-fired power plants in the United States. Okay. Um, so, as a segue, okay. of course, I know you <laughs> know that in Oregon and Washington, we have plans to get our last coal-fired power plants off of coal. We're mm -hmm. saying, hey, it doesn't make sense to burn this dirty 19th century fossil fuel anymore. The health consequences are too, so, too severe. The environmental consequences, especially the climate impacts of burning coal um, are too large. And um, so we need to move away from coal and on to clean energy. Mm -hmm. And so Oregon will, be, will stop burning coal within the state limits by 2020, and okay. Washington will stop burning coal by 2025. Oh, excellent, okay, yeah. good, right. Yeah. Uh, so, w b it, it isn't the coal that comes from Powder River cleaner than that which comes from these other sources? Of, of course, that's what, that's what they're saying. You, know, you and I both know there's no such thing as clean coal. When you look at coal mining to shipping coal to burning coal to generate electricity, to disposing of coal ash and other toxic coal waste. There's, there's no, it's, it's dirty from, uh, it's harmful to our health, it's harmful to the environment, it's harmful to communities from start to finish. And we, we like to say coal anywhere harms communities everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, the Powder River Basin coal has um, lower sulfur dioxide emissions than other kinds of coal. So that's where they're saying, okay, the, the impacts um, to acid rain are going to be um, less significant with Powder River Basin coal. But you still have, you know, you're, you're tearing up the earth to get at coal seams. You're polluting thousands of miles of rivers. Um, you are releasing toxic substances like mercury, arsenic, and lead into the air that we all have to breathe. Uh -huh. And um, of course, you have carbon pollution. Um, coal is a leading source of carbon pollution, which is a leading contributor to dangerous climate disruption, right. including severe weather events. So we absolutely must move off of coal, and, and we're seeing this trend across the United States. So as, as the demand for coal in the U.S. is stagnating and decreasing, and we're switching off onto cleaner energy, mm -hmm. Um, coal companies are, they're scrambling. They're looking for ways to make profits in other markets. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where um, coal exports come in. Ah, uh, coal exports, mm -hmm. right. Which is why we're talking about so many more loads of, train loads of this coal coming from Powder, Powder, uh, Powder River? Powder River Basin, Powder yes. River Basin Powder River Basin. Into the Pacific Northwest. Yes, exactly. Right. So describe some of the plans for these exports. Well, let's yeah, do, before, right. we go, before yeah. we go there, why, uh, uh, other than just because the amount of coal which is being used in the United States is decreasing, uh -huh. and so they're looking to at least maintain the current usage, yep. and th so are they thinking of, of exporting. But it's also very profitable for these companies to export it. Right, right, right. The, the demand for coal abroad, especially in Asia, in countries like China and India, the demand for coal is very high. Uh -huh. Um, and they're already importing coal from Australia, from Mongolia, from Russia, and uh, burning some of their own coal. There's, there are very large coal deposits in China. Um, but um, where, the, where the demand for coal is high and, um, and demand for coal in the U.S. is decreasing, 
uh, coal companies are, are looking to exploit that market. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and some very significant profits. Right. But the difference, I, I was in preparation for this, and I mm -hmm. can't remember the exact figures, but it was like uh, the, the cost for mining Powder River coal is about $10 a ton versus from the Appalachian, some of these other sources which are getting up to $100 a ton. So mm -hmm. the amount of profit that they can make from exporting this resource is, is tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Because and it's all going to go into a single market, right. single worldwide market. Right, and, and one reason why it's so profitable for them to, exp to, to um, exploit coal is because it's so sub heavily subsidized uh, with yes. our tax dollars. Oh, uh, yes. Which is, um, yeah. I, so we get it several places. Right, okay. right, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So yeah. uh, t talk about some of the plans here in the Pacific Northwest for building these terminals. Right, right. So if you look at, okay, one of the largest deposits of coal in the world is in the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming. And the largest demand for coal to, you know, to burn coal to generate electricity is abroad in Asia. In Asia. Um, and um, the quickest path between Montana and Asia is, of course, right through the Pacific Northwest. Uh -huh. So what we've seen in the past year and a half or so is six proposed coal export terminals in Oregon and Washington, three in Oregon and three in Washington. Okay. These are, this is Peabody Energy, this is Arch Coal, these are the, this is big bad coal. Um, this is Australian companies like Amber Energy and Texas-based Kinder Morgan. Mm -hmm. And they want to build some of the largest coal export terminals in the world. They want to put them right here in our backyards. Mm -hmm. So what this would mean for um, folks throughout the Pacific Northwest um, is dozens of coal trains passing through their communities every day. Some communities like Spokane could see 50 or more coal trains every day. The Columbia River Gorge could see 20 or more coal trains every day. Mile and a half long coal trains, uh -huh. open air. So it's, it's too expensive for them to, to mitigate coal dust coming off of the coal trains. So Railroad, the railroad industry has shown that 500 to 1,000 pounds of coal dust comes off of every single rail car in a mile and a half long train. And uh, that's 110 train okay. cars long. Would, would you just repeat that? Okay, so every car and, and each, each car on a coal train is over 100 cars long. Uh -huh. Each car produces 500 to 1,000 pounds of coal dust. Wow. Each yeah. car. Each, each car. car. <laughs> right. Just, right. I, I'm blown away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And so th anyway, they're, they're, uh, the railroad and coal shippers, they're fighting right now about, you know, who's going to have to pay to mitigate the coal dust because, well, one, coal dust, it does, it, it causes serious health problems. It uh -huh. contains mercury and arsenic and lead, mm -hmm. and it's linked to lung cancer and asthma. Of course, you also have the diesel pollution because it requires a lot of diesel pollution, uh, diesel to move these heavy, very heavy coal trains. So for communities, especially right around the train tracks, um, this is a serious, this is a serious health uh, impact, uh -huh. serious health threat, um, and and of course, communities around coal trains, you know, often already have a, an air quality problem or have health problems. You know, you look at North Portland, you look at Spokane, you look at Longview. Um, these are communities where they need, you know, and they're working hard to improve their air quality, and this would undermine all of that hard work. Um, but another serious problem is coal train derailments. So the real reason why rail companies are trying to get coal shippers to mitigate the coal dust is because coal dust builds up on the tracks and causes very dangerous train derailments. Hmm. Um, but, of course, they're fighting over who's going to have to pay for the coal dust mitigation. Oh, okay. Um, so so you look at, like, Portland is a community where we would see a dozen or more coal trains coming through every day. And these are all wow. impacts that we, we would experience. Yeah. And so when they come into Portland, they're coming from, uh, Columbia, from River the Gorge. Columbia River Gorge, yep. Hood River, and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, and then when they come into Portland, they're coming into north. 
So the northern part of northeast right. Portland yep. and, and then into out North northwest Portland. West Portland over to Clatskanie. So through St. Helens and up the Columbia River out to Clatskanie. How, how, how do they get across the Willamette River? Where, where does that crossing happen? Um, well, or do, or does yeah, it? so it's interesting. They haven't disclosed the complete, their complete plans for how they're going to get coal to uh, Port Westward and Clatskanie on the Columbia River and uh -huh. to Coos Bay. Um, they they haven't disclosed oh, their course plans not, because <laughs> you know people may get upset. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh -huh. They know that the more we know, the more we're going to fight it. Uh -huh. And so there are several routes. Um, all of them are through Portland. You have to go through Portland to get to Clatskanie and to get uh -huh. to Coos Bay. You also have to travel through dozens of other communities, of course. Um, and then I should mention that the sixth coal export proposal is coal barging down the Columbia River. Uh -huh. So this would, of course, be by rail from Montana to the Columbia River, and then in eastern Oregon at the Port of Morrow, uh -huh. they would transfer the coal from the, the trains to barges, barge it down the Columbia River, and then transfer it to the, the large transocean freighters to go across the Pacific Ocean to Asia. Uh -huh. So that's a, that, that project is on a very urgent timeline. Um, the state of Oregon has to make their decision, or uh, you know, they're announcing their decision on whether to approve, deny, or postpone this dirty coal barging on the Columbia River project um, in the next month, yeah. actually. Is, uh, are, are, are we talking about, in these proposals, are we talking about mm -hmm. eventually ending up with just one terminal, or are we talking about possibly having all three or we six if we include Washington? Right, we uh -huh. could have all six. Wow. We could, okay. yeah. They're, they're different companies they're, that are investing in different projects. It's sort of a scramble you know, between all of these coal companies. Okay. See who, you know, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. So we could have all six. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, how, have, how have communities reacted to these proposals? Yeah, that's a good question. Like I said, coal companies know that the more we know, the more we'll fight it. And the reason that they know that is because they've seen it so far. Um, so I, I mentioned that we've been fighting these projects for a year and a half, um, and and it's it's been amazing to see you know folks from Bellingham, Washington, to Coos Bay, Oregon, to Spokane, Washington, to Idaho, to Montana, all over the region are mm -hmm. fighting this, mm -hmm. and um, it's been it, it's been amazing. I mean, we've seen thousands of people turning out to rallies and. Yeah. The unprecedented numbers of petitions to our state leaders and um, members of Congress, and uh, right. And I, I, I mm -hmm. saw online a report that 800 people turned out to a hearing in Bellingham. Bellingham is a pretty small little town yeah, right. up in up in uh, northern right. uh, Washington for 800 people to turn out for right. a hearing. That's a phenomenal turnout. Right, right. right. It is. Right. It really is. Yeah, and evidently the. Uh, consensus was that no, we don't want uh, coal trains coming through our community. Yes, right. loud right. and clear. Because of the health impacts, the safety impacts, the economic impacts, uh -huh. nobody wants to be known as a coal town. I mean, yeah. we we know well in the Pacific Northwest that that stigma sort of associated with, um, uh, with uh, dirty fossil fuels, and we've been working really hard to, you know, in Portland and, and in Bellingham and many other communities towards this image of, you know, here we care about clean air, mm -hmm. we care about a sustain, having a sustainable community, we care about our carbon footprint, and dirty coal exports would fly in the face of all of this hard work we're uh, doing. I mean, right. it makes no sense for us to work to get our coal plants off of coal, uh, yeah, right. you know, 10 million tons of coal per year if, if coal companies are going to turn around and ship 100 million tons of coal right through. Right. Pacific uh, Northwest. Yeah. Because after it is exported and it ends up in Europe, in Asia, right. then tell us about that process. It kind right. of returns to us. It returns to us, of course. We know that a, a fifth of the air pollution and water pollution that we see in the Pacific Northwest comes uh -huh. from abroad. Yeah. So 18% of the mercury in the Willamette River, for example, we know how harmful mercury is. Uh -huh. That comes from coal burned abroad. Oh, that's interesting. And, yeah. and the, the, with all of this export, then that's just become larger and larger and larger. Right, right, uh -huh. right. This, this, the amount of coal that they want to export is enormous. Just initial number crunching of what the carbon impact would be um, placed it at par with the Keystone XL pipeline. 
Oh. And, and we know how the climate movement has been fighting the Keystone XL pipeline. Mm -hmm. So we're essentially fighting a Keystone XL pipeline of coal trains and coal barges going right through our backyards oh. here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. yeah. Governor Kitzhoffer here in, in Oregon recently issued mm -hmm. a statement. Yes, tell he did. About, yeah. Tell us about so what he said. Governor Kitzhoffer, um, Oregonians from across the state have been calling on Governor Kitzhoffer to take action for, for months. And he um, finally echoed our concerns um, and wrote a letter to federal agencies calling for a complete review of the I impacts of the environmental impacts of coal exports. He actually called for a review of the cumulative impacts of all six proposed coal export terminals because many communities, including Portland, would be impacted by numerous coal export projects. Right. Uh -huh. um, and so that's a and typically yeah. typically each one of these right. proposals would have a single environmental impact a single, statement. Single, yeah, right. Or so even this is rather this far sighted for him to make this. Yes, it is. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and I mean, it's really what we need is a cumulative review of the impacts. And um, you know, what we were seeing with the coal barging project is even narrower than that. They weren't even going to do a full environmental impact statement on that. And so, and this is because coal companies know the more that the chance is going to have, the public is going to have a chance to weigh in, the uh -huh. more that, the more difficult it will be for them to push their project through. Um, so we called for this cum cumulative re review of the environmental impacts of coal exports. Um, what we want for him to do now is take his leadership a step further and also deny these state permits for coal exports. Uh, so right now the state is making their decision on the 9 million tons of coal going right down the Columbia River. This would, on barges. Yeah, uh -huh. So this would be ni 9 million tons of dirty coal traveling down our river, um, that doubling the amount of barge traffic on the Columbia River. Uh -huh. So if wow. you think about the eco-tourism so, impacts of uh, that. Yeah, I yeah. was just thinking about that, uh, exactly. It was. Right. Is that, y yes, that's a tremendous amount. Yeah, the impacts uh, on our, to right, our fisheries, yeah, to our right. salmon. The tribes yeah. are very concerned about this coal barging proposal. So uh -huh. we need Governor Kitzhaber to deny that project as well. And I actually brought, I have Governor Kitzhaber's phone number here if you want me to uh, announce yeah, please. it. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. great. So 503-378-4582 um, is Governor Kitzhaber's phone number to call him and say, I'm concerned about coal exports, please do everything that you can to prevent Oregon from becoming a conduit for dirty coal exports. Uh -huh. And again, okay. that number is 503-378-4582. Excellent, very good. Yeah. Um, what about in Washington State? Are mm. we seeing any opposition like from the governor there or from any committees, review regulatory things? Well, the, the EPA um, also wrote a letter, a um, very strong letter uh -huh. calling for environmental review. Yeah. Um, and um, and we are seeing we're seeing some movement from leaders in Washington as well, but it's going to take a lot of um, uh, public pressure to really move our leaders in the mm -hmm. right direction. So, okay. um, write your I would say to viewers, write your elected officials, you know, write your members of Congress and say, hey, this is something I'm really concerned about. Oh, great. Okay. Good. Yeah. And uh, anything else that viewers can do? Yeah, of course. So right here in Portland, there mm -hmm. are a number of groups that are, that are involved in coal exports, and um, the group that I work with is the Sierra Club Beyond Coal Task Force, and we meet monthly uh -huh. um, at the Sierra Club office on East, you know, East Burnside and 18th. Um, so, um, and uh, we meet every fourth Tuesday of the month at 6:30. And my email address has been up on the screen, so you can right, shoot uh -huh. me. Uh, viewers okay. can shoot me an email and ask for more information about how they can help out. Okay, with that. and that that information, the meeting times, is all on your website, also. Yes, right. yes. Okay, yeah. we've had that information up also. Yeah. So, okay, good. Uh, yeah, they can also. Um, the Sierra Club's part of a very large coalition yes. called uh -huh. the Power Past Coal Coalition. Includes Columbia River Keeper, Climate Solutions, Greenpeace, Friends of the Gorge, Cruise Water Keeper, Alliance uh, for Democracy. Uh, Alliance for Democracy, great. <laughs> <laughs> many. <laughs> there we go. Many, many groups. Uh -huh. um, and um, so, you know, you can get involved with with any of those groups or with your neighborhood associations, whichever groups 
viewers are already involved with yeah. and, um, and then, uh, ask them to help out. Yeah, yeah. Recently you had a, a kind of a community meeting in St. John's, is that right? We did, uh, yeah. So we're holding these forums. Um, it, went, it went really great. I mean, we're holding these forums throughout the city. Um, we're calling them Coal Hard Truth Forums. Uh, for folks in the community to come and learn more about the health, safety, environmental, and economic mm -hmm. impacts. Um, and I understand one of your cameramen, um, Dave yeah. King, spoke oh, yeah. at, the, uh -huh. at the forum, so um, it was really great. great. Okay. Um, and so keep your eyes peeled for a forum coming Okay. And <laughs> those would be you. on your website also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. when, when uh -huh. one's planned. Right. Or okay. they can contact me if they would like to host a forum in their oh, yeah. community okay. or host a speaker at their neighborhood association uh -huh. okay. or other community group. Okay, because it's all that. about spreading the word. It's all about oh, spreading the word. Like, it's really. one of those things, automatic, if yeah. people hear about this happening, people are opposed to it. And then the yeah. question is, how do you actually get them right. to go beyond just right. grumbling about it to actually doing something right. about it? Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much Thanks for being so much, our guest. Thanks so much, David, for having me. I appreciate okay. it. All right, good. Yeah. So we've been talking with Laura Stevens. Laura is the organizing representative for the Beyond Coal campaign of the Sierra Club. For more information about the about the campaign, you can go to their website, which is uh, www.coalfreeoregon.org. Um, the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our crew today. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, and Tom Thomas. And I want to thank the audience for watching. We hope that we'll see you again next week. So long. <laughs>